You're not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. Right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. You're the only God who is power none can contend you're the only god whose name and praise will never end you're the only god who's worthy of everything we can give and you are god and that's just the way it is you are god alone from before time you are on your throne. You are God alone. Right now, in the good times and bad, but you are on your throne. And you are God alone. Unchangeable, unchangeable, unshakable. Unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. You are God alone, from before time began. You were on your throne, you are God alone. good times and bad, you are on your throne, and you are God alone, unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are, unchangeable, unshakable, Unstoppable, that's what you are. And it's really amazing that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still loves every person in the world just as much as he did when he spread out his arms on that cross. He still has just as much mercy today as then. And we change, the world changes. But thank you, Lord, that even when we are unfaithful, you never change. Amen. And you don't cease to, to, to convict us, Holy Spirit, and to point us to Jesus. Thank you for not leaving us in our sins. We thank you that you give us the victory. Lord, we all, we're all here, or at least I hope we're all here because we've trusted in the name of Jesus Christ. 
in the blood of your sacrifice. And we have a personal relationship with you. And if there is anyone who has not learned what that is, Lord, please show yourself to them. And people in our lives who haven't given their lives to you, Lord, people I, who I work with, family members, put your love in our hearts to love them like you love them, Lord. We just worship you. You're the God who made the heavens and the earth and all that's in it. You're unchangeable and you're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. Thank you, Lord, that you are unchangeable you're unshakable unstoppable that's what you are you're unchangeable unshakable unstoppable that's what you are you are God alone before time began, and you were on your throne, you are God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone. We declare it because it's true. We're going to begin in Psalm 22. We're reading verses 6 through 18. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, 
our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. As our brother said, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are very important for me personally. The reason I am saved today is because I sat in a church at one point in time and he opened up the book of Daniel and he described how Daniel had foretold four world kingdoms and how each of those kingdoms passed exactly like Daniel said. Now, as, a, as a, uh, an academic, that intrigued me. How could anybody tell the future? Now, I had said I was a Christian, but I was an unsaved man. And so I asked the question, how could anybody tell the future? There's only one way anybody could tell the future and get it right every time. They either controlled all events or they had all knowledge or both. That means there is someone greater than our universe. There has to be. And that led me to ask the question, can I prove the Bible? Can I disprove the Bible? Now, unfortunately, not enough people take that uh, uh, tact, if you will. They just believe it because it's a religious belief they had. It was in their family or there's a bunch of good people in that church. But I tell you, God does not want people to have no reason for their faith. He came that we might believe. John wrote the gospel of John. He said that we might believe. Now, according to God, and my brother read from Isaiah 46, but also in Isaiah 41, verse 23, according to God, the way you prove that you are God is you tell the future. And you're always right. That's how you prove that you're God. And I want to say something that will be shocking. Now, this is for the critics. So I'm speaking to you as if you are not believers. So I'm going to address you as non-believers, and I would uh, encourage you to share this teaching with non-believers. Outside of the Bible, there is in fact no other single accurate prophecy in any other religion. Now that is a broad statement, and when I heard that, I didn't believe it, so I began researching the Tripitaka and the Vedas and the Quran, looking for prophecies, any prophecies. There are a few in the Quran, very general prophecies about cutting an animal's ear and therefore proving genetic manipulation by scientists in the last days, really, really, really stretching. There are prophecies in the Tripitaka saying that in the last days there'll be bad times. But the Bible does something no other religious book does. It proclaims the exact future and then says, if it does not happen, I am not God. If it does happen, I am. 25% of the Bible was foretelling the future. Thousands upon thousands of predictions. 
specific and exact. The proof is in the prophecy. We're gonna go through John 19. In the death of Jesus, the last day, the last 24 hours of Jesus, there are more than 30 prophecies, exact prophecies. Prophecies about how he would die. Not that he would die, how he would die. Prophecies about what the people who are standing next to him say and do while he's dying. Prophecies about what they will give the Messiah to drink when he dies. Prophecies about who also dies with him, where he is buried, how long he'll be dead, all very exact. Now, critics know this. Those who don't believe God know this. They know what I just said to you. So they have to say, the only way they can negate all these facts, these reasons, these proofs, is to say that it was written after it happened. Because it's true, and they know it's true. They don't even argue that it's true. It's true. He died on a cross. They pierced his side. They gave him vinegar. The soldiers drew lots for his clothing. They they know it's all true. The only way they can get around it is to say it wasn't prophecy. And all we could do until about 100 years ago as Christians is say, nah. Because we didn't have what we have today. You are in a generation, there's no way anybody should be a non-believer in this generation. No reasonable way. Because in 1947, a little shepherd boy by the Dead Sea, was throwing a rock at a goat. And he missed the rock and it went into a cave and he heard pottery shatter. And he crawled in and he discovered what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Probably the single greatest gift to God in our generation, from God to our generation. Because inside this, they found this old Essene community who had kept scriptures, thousands, 2,000 year old scriptures sealed in jars. Thousands, tens of thousands of scrolls and fragments, many of them predating Jesus, proved to be written before Jesus. Factually, intellectually, academically, without anybody able to say they're not. And in that, we find the prophecies of Jesus' death. We find Psalm 22. We find Isaiah 53. And the only answer the critics can say is, (laughs) that's it. They have no response. You have the proof. They do not have the proof. So these prophecies are the centerpiece of John chapter 19. In John 19, John is going to choose not to talk about a lot of the things the other gospels talked about. He's going to talk specifically about these prophetic events that were told, foretold would happen, proving so that you would believe. I want you to believe. I want you to at least, if you don't believe, come to the conclusion that you've rejected all facts and don't believe. You gotta at least do that. Walk away and say, you know, it's all true, but I still reject it. Then I'm okay. But you at least need to stop and think about the facts. Just the facts of Christianity. So we start in John 18. I'm gonna read from verse 36 on. God bless this word. Challenge us. Amen. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world in order that I should bear witness to the truth. I'm bearing witness to the truth today. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. 
To not accept what you're gonna hear today is to actually reject truth and you are not a person of truth. You don't want truth. You want something else. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. There was a Passover custom, just sort of a, out of the magnam, magnanimity of, of Pilate. He would just release one of their prisoners to celebrate the feast with them. So he's like, okay, he's condemned. I'm going to release him. You have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. The Gospels tell us Barabbas, I'm just going to quote the Gospels, Matthew 27, was a notorious prisoner, kind of a famous bad guy, Jesse James. Mark says he was a rebel and he was a murderer. And John throws in, and he was a robber too. Really a wonderful man. But none of that mattered to them. None of that mattered. This had nothing to do with truth. This had zero to do with truth. This was an uncontrollable and senseless rage. It, was, it wasn't even smart, even if he, he was a bad guy. It wasn't smart to kill Jesus on Passover. It's Passover. Tomorrow is the Sabbath. No, not even tomorrow. We're talking about in less than 12 hours. It's a Sabbath and you can't move. You gotta get him killed quick. You'd at least wait until after the Passover. No, not at all. How about the fact that Jesus had probably healed some of their friends? Jesus had probably taken care of them. But once again, you must remember these things. Evil has nothing to do with truth. There is no logic in arguing with someone who is set on evil. You are not going to call up Putin and talk him out of the idiocy of what he's doing, though it's crushing his own country and possibly destroying the world. He's not going to listen. Logic has nothing to do with it. Wickedness, in fact, Romans 1 tells us, if you persist in wickedness, you lose the ability to reason. You can no longer do simple math. You lose your ability to reason. Now, between Luke's account in Luke 23 and John's account, poor Pilate, you got to walk away from this. Pilate was not an evil man. Now, he was a sinful man, but not an evil man. Pilate absolutely does not want to crucify or execute Jesus. Five times in Luke's account and John's account, five different separate times, he tries to release him. He tries every trick in the book. He's a good politician. First, he tries by making the crowd feel guilty. Why? What has he done? Right? Then he attempts to reason with them. Wait. That's a bad idea. Then he tries political loopholes. Then he even tries, okay, okay, I'll beat him. I'll humiliate him in front of them. Maybe they'll have compassion and it'll appease their bloodlust. None of it worked. None of it worked. So then Pilate took him and scourged him. He beats Jesus with a flagellum. Verse one, a flagellum was like a cat of nine tails. It was, a, it was not a big bull whip. It was a, like a baseball bat with, with leather on the end. And there was about nine or 10 or a dozen different straps of leather. And on the end of the straps of leather, they put objects like bone or, or rock. or So it cut every time you whipped, it cut. And in fact, it was designed for the purpose of confession. It was a terrible thing. In fact, people's ribs were exposed when they were beaten with it. And many died during scourging before they ever got executed. They died during the confessional time. And so they would beat the prisoner with this. And if the prisoner would just confess to things they didn't know, they would lessen the whipping. They'd still whip him, but they'd, they'd lessen it. If he confessed nothing, they would keep going until it was a two-handed jumping swing. Did Jesus confess anything? I want you to think about how hard they hit him. Now, here's the thing. When the Dead Seas were discovered, in the Dead Seas, there is one complete scroll of the book of Isaiah. It's the oldest. 
It was about a thousand years older than the one we had before. Think about that. And it predates Jesus by two or 300 years, but you can prove it. And inside that scroll, as we read, you hear this. He was wounded for our transgressions. That's pretty general. He was bruised for our iniquities. Okay. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. I can get that. By his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah said, I want you to know, the Messiah, the Savior, shall be whipped before he is executed. Do not pass that by. By his stripes, we are healed. I mean, the person who's striped has been whipped. The Messiah will pay off your judgment, my judgment, not just on the cross, but by every swing of that whip was for me. And Jesus took it and he did not recant anything. So we talk about Jesus on the cross, but Jesus at the stake being whipped was being whipped for us. But it specifically names the Messiah will be beaten, will be striped. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Now, I do not know why anybody would do that, especially since Pilate didn't want to execute him. But again, evil is afoot. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. They beat Jesus after he'd been whipped. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold! I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. In other words, I whipped him with a cat of nine tails 40 times and there was no confession of guilt. He's innocent. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to them, behold the man. Why is he doing this? He's trying to show them that I can prove to you this man is innocent. We have seriously harmed him and he's confessed nothing. I find no guilt and we couldn't even get it off the rack. Therefore, when the chief priests saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him for I find no fault in him. Pilate does not want to do this. He wants nothing to do with this. Don't forget, his God even spoke to his wife. I think God was giving Pilate the chance of a lifetime, face to face with the Son of God. Not only that, God gives Pilate's wife a prophetic dream. I mean, how often do you think she wrote a note to him when he was in the middle of judging someone and said these words, have nothing to do with that just man. I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. He got a personal note from his wife. Don't kill that man. He is a holy man. He doesn't want to kill him. You take him, you kill him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. So Pilate says, I don't want anything to do with this. They had said he had tried to usurp the power of Caesar. That's what their official crime had been, but it slipped out. They were caught up in the moment and they said, he's gotta die. He says he's the son of God. Now, already Jesus has left an impression with Pilate. He's already confounded. You're a king from above. Your kingdom's not of this world. You speak truth. Then they say he's the son of God. Now, you can see, if you have a movie camera and you zoom in, you can see when they say he's the son of God, you see this in the eyes of Pilate. The son of God. Now, did he believe it? Maybe a little bit. Eventually, The Roman soldier believes it. Truly, this was the son of God. It would fit within some of Pilate's beliefs as a Roman with the Greek religions that the gods walked among us. He's freaked out. He might be killing the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went in again into the praetorium, the guardhouse. 
And she's talking to Jesus. Wait, 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 wait a second. Son of God? He asked him, where are you from? Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Why? Because God had already told us through Isaiah a thousand years earlier, or 700 years earlier, that in fact the Messiah, even when he was oppressed and afflicted, he will not open his mouth. As a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he will not open his mouth mouth and there is nothing scarier than being unsure of your decision and the other person as you're talking to them simply doesn't answer just looks into your eyes it is the most unnerving thing then Pilate said to him are you not speaking to me do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you he's kind of trying to work into Jesus' inside there. And Jesus answered, he spoke. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Oh, that's nice, that's relieving. Pilate had a lot of peace about that. He tells Pilate, it's okay. You've been put into this position by God. What's the position? the position to choose. You've been given a choice. It was forced upon you, yes. This decision was forced upon you. Jesus recognized that. And perhaps you can get a little bit of comfort, Pilate, from the fact that the ones who forced the issue on you, well, they go to a worse hell than you. If you don't decide for truth. There are greater sins and there are lesser sins in the scriptures. Do you know that? People ask, is any sin any worse than any other sin? Well, Paul says there are some sins that are worse than other sins. Sexual immorality, you sin against your own body. He said other sins are done out of the body, but sexual immorality, you're actually doing it to your own body and you're the temple of God. It's a bad sin. There's also in Luke 12 where Jesus said, yeah, there are people who knew the right thing and didn't do it and they get many stripes and there are people who knew, didn't know the right thing and, did, and still did wrong. Well, they got fewer stripes. There is a difference in judgment. There is a difference in judgment. We do not all go to the exact same place saved or lost. There are differences in rewards, there are differences in judgments. But, Pilate, every sin is a sin, and every sin will be judged. But it's okay. Your hell is not as bad as the hell of the Jews who uh, sent me to you. That's what he just said to Pilate. Pilate is freaked out, right? From then on, Pilate sought to release him. Okay, I, 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 I just want this guy free, free, free him. For him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Oh, that's bad. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha, which literally means just raised place. So it was a raised sort of area where he could have judgment in a crowd. Pilate is starting to panic, right? Um, he recognizes this guy is not normal. This guy takes 40 lashes with the cat of nine tails and doesn't confess anything. This guy could try and talk him out of judgment, he doesn't even try. He just says, don't worry, your hell's not as bad as the people who gave me to you. The Jews are so crazed. The priests are so insane. Pilate begins to weigh his own consequences. He doesn't care about truth anymore. Man, that is, we need to pray for our politicians. When truth no longer matters because the consequences to you are too high. So Pilate is weighing, I think this guy's probably the son of God, but if they actually come against me, I might lose my job, I might even lose my life. And so he began not to ask what is truth, he began to ask what's good for me. And therein the gospel is lost. Jesus said the words that any man who tries to save his life will lose it. When your only question is, what's good for me, you will miss the gospel. Your only question, my friends, what is truth? What is truth? If it's true, follow it. Amen. If it's not true, reject it. But don't sit in the middle and say, yeah, I do it because it's good for me. 
just what is true. Now, Pilate, he tries one last little trick to not feel guilty. Remember, it says, Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all and that a tumult was rising. So he took water, washed his hands before the multitude and said, because I've washed my hands, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. They couldn't kill Jesus without Pilate's approval. He washed his hands. Was that gonna work? Now, it's interesting we're going to prison. There's a guy who comes to prison. His name is Murph the Surf. He's old now, but he was a murderer and, in fact, part of one of the largest jewel heists in the United States of America. He's a famous guy. They made movies about him. You can look it up. He was convicted in 1969, and he went to, I think it was Alcatraz. It was a high, nasty prison. I think it was Alcatraz. And he has this testimony, and it's stuck in my mind because Pilate's trying to wash away his sins with some water. Will that ever work? No matter how clean you make yourself, you'll never be clean before God. You never will. So Murph's testimony is he was washing his socks and his roomie was a Christian. And he was in there, he said he had his hands in the sink and he was washing these filthy old gray socks, trying to get them clean so he could have clean socks the next day. And as he was washing them, his roomie said, doesn't matter how hard you try, you'll never wash your sins clean. That's what he said to him. And he said he got so mad, he washed him so hard, his knuckles bled. This guy knows nothing. He knows nothing. He knows nothing. And you know what happened? He got saved. Because he can't wash your sins away except in the blood of Jesus. That's it. There's nothing you can do. You can't, you can't change your attitude. You can't change your location. You can't change your family. You can't change your whatever. You can't change anything. You can only be saved by the blood of the lamb. Washing your hands will never make you clean before God. Jesus has to wash you with his own blood. So he washes his hands. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold your king. Now there's some problem. You might want to note this down. This is where Bible critics go nuts, right? There's some problem because there's the sixth hour and there's the ninth hour and there's the third hour and there's a bunch of different hours in the gospels. But it seems that some of them, some of the gospel writers were calculating time the Roman way and some of the gospel writers were calculating time the Hebrew way. The Hebrew way starts at sunrise, the Roman way starts at midnight. Like you and I would say, tomorrow starts at 12.01 a.m. That's the way they calculated time. And so Mark says it was the third hour when they crucified him. Well, how could it be the third hour when they crucified him? And here it's the sixth hour, and they're judging him. Well, the third hour from 6 a.m. It was Hebrew time. So Jesus was crucified, it seems, at nine o'clock. Matthew and Luke say that he was on the cross, and it's on the sixth hour, which would have been noon, Darkness covered the land until the ninth hour, which would have been 3 p.m., Hebrew time, right? But John, he says it was the sixth hour when he was judged, Roman time. That tells you that all of this occurred at 6 a.m. Remember, they did the night trial. This is really early. This whole scene occurs at dawn. This craziness occurs at dawn. Then he delivered him, mm. but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Oh. Now I just wrote down Caesar, their king, this one they're gonna serve. Do you know that Caesar, their king, in a, just a few years, one year, in one year, he's gonna depose Caiaphas, the high priest. And then he's gonna destroy the house of Annas, the high priest's family. And he's gonna banish Pilate, this king they're all serving. Gonna banish Pilate to Gaul where he commits suicide. And then within 30 years, their king that they serve is gonna crucify so many of them that historians say, quote, space was wanting for the crosses and crosses for the bodies. They killed so many Jews on the cross. That was their king. Can I tell you that the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, 
and destroy. People who are rejecting Jesus are rejecting freedom. They're rejecting peace. They're rejecting hope. They don't want truth. And so what they get is the father of lies and they get enslaved, they get in turmoil and they get in despair. That's why the world acts the way the world acts. They are serving a bad king. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place. So then they delivered him to, to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull in English, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, which means skull, which in Latin is called Calvary, skull. Okay, so they all mean the same thing. Where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, the place of the skull had a different name 2,000 years earlier. Mount Moriah. Abraham, 2,000 years earlier, check this out, had been told by his God, go kill your son. And then he clarifies it, not just your son, your only son whom you love. And he made his son carry his own sacrificial wood up that same hillside. And he got up to the top and he was going to kill his son according to God's plan. And God said, nope. And he stopped it. Don't kill your son. I'll give you a substitute. Abraham renamed Mount Moriah. Do you know what he renamed it? Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And it even says in Genesis 22, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this very day, in the mountain of the Lord, it will be seen. It was a prophecy 2,000 years old. Because it didn't say this is where God provided a substitute. Abraham, it doesn't say was provided a substitute. It says God will provide in this place a substitute. David wrote the Psalm of the Cross a thousand years before Jesus was around. A thousand years. And in fact, wrote these words. The congregation of the wicked, we read it, will pierce me. Not just pierce me, they'll pierce my hands and they'll pierce my feet. Now why in the world would David write that? Had he ever seen anybody's hands pierced and feet pierced? Is that what they did to prisoners? They pierced their hands and feet. No, why would he write that? And we have this in the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls. We have it before Jesus. They pierced my hands and my feet. The first recorded historical recording of any crucifixion was around 516 BC. The, the Persians, Darius in fact actually, crucified people. And the reason was they thought if you died on the ground, you were still kind of blessed because of their pagan religion. So you needed to die hung up in the air. And they didn't take them down. They just hung them up and let them die on the cross and then let the animals eat them. They never took the bodies down. How did David know there was gonna be a piercing? And not just a piercing, but hands and feet. Now, do you know how you crucify somebody? Because I'll explain it to you. The way they actually do it, they've actually found bodies that were crucified, is they stretch your arms out. If they, if they use nails, they do it on the ground. They stretch your arms out. They drive a nail through this part of your arm so that your bones can hang and not your hands don't just rip out between your fingers. And so they do that. And then they turn your legs sideways. And they drive a nail, not like this, through the top of your foot, but through basically in front of your Achilles. And they, and they bend your knees slightly and they drive a nail so you're sitting like this. This is how you're on the cross. You're not on the cross like this, you're like this. Slightly bent and they put a hook right about here so that you can rest if you need to. You can hook yourself to be able to rest and it slowly rips you all the way up. And there you sit until either, it talks about what happens, I've read some physicians, talks about how basically you begin to actually pump faster because you can't breathe, so your heart rate goes way up, and pushing out the fluids into your chest cavity and into the rest of your body, and you end up, you could drown, you could asphyxiate, or you could just die of blood loss. 
It, all those things occurred. If you didn't die fast enough, as you're gonna find out, then they would, because you were pushing on your leg, then they would break your legs so you couldn't push on your legs anymore and you would slowly die because your diaphragm was stretched out and you couldn't take a breath. And so you'd asphyxiate within a few minutes. Otherwise, you could last for days if you were strong enough to push up and breathe. How did David know that? At least historically and archeologically, David had never seen a crucifixion and wouldn't for another 500 years. And it's in Psalm 22. How is that possible? It's called the Psalm of the Cross. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read the title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. So people were walking back and forth and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Everybody could read it. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. In other words, climb back up there, take that down and put a new sign up. But Pilate, he got some gumption. He said, I am the, but, but write down that he said, I am the king of the Jews. But Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. I'm not changing the sign. It's there. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart. There were four soldiers. And also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. What in the world? So first of all, crucifixion usually occurred in nakedness or near nakedness. So sometimes no clothing at all. Sometimes for the sake of the culture, they would wrap a loincloth, but they'd take them all, all their clothes off. Jesus humbled himself. I want you to think about that one. Point. Humbled himself to the death of a cross, a naked humiliating, excruciating death. He came, when Jesus came all the way down, you know what? So he could save the worst. Nobody could say, Jesus can't reach me. He came all the way down. The Bible says he became sin that we might become righteousness in him. Now, wait a second. How is it possible that David wrote these words? After they pierce me, they will divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. How did he know? A thousand years later, there was four soldiers and five pieces of clothing. How did he know? God is real. Amen. How many people do you know that have been pierced, and then after they were pierced, they had a lottery for their clothes? Anybody? Anybody? Very specific. Now, therefore, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, if you compare Mark 15, you can write it down, it's in your notes. Mark 15, 40, and Matthew 27, 56, with this verse, the conclusion you have to come to is that Mary's sister was named Salome, and she was Zebedee's wife, which means James and John were cousins to Jesus. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his home. Now, it is difficult to comprehend what Mary was feeling. She was at the cross. But God had also given her a prophecy when she had presented Jesus at the temple as a baby, a man named Simeon had taken him up in his arms and he said these words, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus reveals the thoughts of people's hearts. And Mary had a sword in her soul. Now, I just want to take a side note to say, the Bible seems really clear. If you are a follower of Jesus, take care of your parents. Jesus is on the cross, 
hanging on a nail. And he sees his mom and he thinks, who's gonna take care of her? Remember, at this point in time, James and Jude, his brothers, weren't believers. He didn't say, James and Jude, take care of mom. He looked to the believers. He said, John, take care of mom. He cared for her. Do you know the Bible actually says these words? Listen to them carefully. If you're wondering what to do with your aging parents, listen to this. 1 Timothy 5.4. If there is any widow who has children or grandchildren, If there's any widow who has children or grandchildren, let the Christians learn to show godliness at home and to repay their parents. That's what it says. For this is good and acceptable before God. The Christian takes care of his aging mother or father or grandmother or grandfather. That is Christianity and it is countercultural. Put them away, put them away, put them away. I don't want to see them, put them away. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't situations where you need medical help, but you can never abandon them. The scriptures say, in fact, I won't read the next verse. It's very offensive. 1 Timothy 5, 5, you should read it. It's very offensive. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, so Jesus knew everything, he's going down the list In fact, he'd started by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because he was leading them to Psalm 22, which starts, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? People argue, was he forsaken? He was clearly telling them, open up to Psalm 22 and watch people as they wag their head and they shoot out their lip and as they circle me and they gape and they pierce me and they lottery my clothes and the whole thing is all there to be seen. Jesus, knowing all this, there was one more thing that wasn't fulfilled. He's about to give up, literally hand over his soul. Nobody took Jesus' life. It literally says, it's in the active voice. It says, he gave his soul up. He said, okay, he even said it to his dad, into your hands, Father, I commit my soul. Nobody took Jesus' life. He said, okay, time is done. And it had to be done because they were about to break his legs, but I'll get to that. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Why did Jesus say, I thirst? Someone read it. Tell me why Jesus said, I thirst. Someone just blurt it out. Why did Jesus say, I thirst? What does the Bible say? so the scripture could be fulfilled. Was he thirsty? Yes. Was he thirsty three hours ago? Yes. They'd even tried to offer him drugged wine, a narcotic, so he's a little sleepy and the pain wasn't quite so bad and he could die faster. Did he drink it? No, because he was taking the full wrath of God for me. But now he said, wait a second, in his mind, there is still a scripture that needs to be fulfilled. What is the scripture? Are you ready? Psalm 69, 21. A thousand years earlier, David said, for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And so he says, wait, I haven't had the vinegar. David said, I will identify the Messiah. While they're killing him, they're gonna give him vinegar to drink. They're gonna whip him right? He's not going to say a word. These are all prophecies. They're going to crucify him, piercing his hands and his feet. They're going to lottery his clothes off. They're going to, in fact, give him vinegar to drink while he's dying. Now, how hard would it be to repeat that? Very. Thousand years before it ever happened. Why do I believe in Jesus? Because you have to. Or You have to reject truth because everything I'm telling you, we have evidence was written before Jesus because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have ancient manuscripts that predate this. So it was actually written. And so now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. King James calls it vinegar. And they filled a sponge with sour wine or vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. I'm not even going to touch on the fact that they could have used any stick whatsoever, but they used the same exact thing, hyssop, that they had dipped the lamb's blood in for Passover and put it on their door. That's what they dipped and gave to Jesus on his bloody face. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it's finished. And bowing his head, he himself gave up his spirit. He said the word, and you probably have heard it. It's a famous Greek word. It's probably the only Greek word most of us know, tetelestai, tetelestai. 
I looked it up. Here's just the various definitions of, Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says this, his last words, finished, completed, fulfilled, paid off. That's what tetelestai means. The Levitical priesthood, finished. The temple's ministry, finished. Judgment against sin, finished. All sacrifices, finished. From the orchard of Eden until that very moment, people had been sinning and trying to get their sins forgiven by bleeding out an animal. Jesus said, no more. Hebrews says, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. No more. You just want to think about a complete shift? For thousands of years, they've been killing a lamb. Jesus said, no more. I'm it. I'm the one, only, and last, final sacrifice. Literally, 1 John says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from every single sin forever. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. For that Sabbath was a high day. This is important to note, for me at least, not having been raised in a good Catholic home or a good Protestant home, I never thought about Good Friday. I don't believe in Good Friday anymore. I don't believe Jesus was crucified on Friday. Why? Because Jesus said three days and three nights. Sunday, backwards, Saturday, Friday, Thursday. I believe Jesus was crucified on Thursday, but it says right here that it was Sabbath. It was, it, they were preparing for the Sabbath. Well, according to what it says in Exodus 12, 12, the first day after Passover was always a Sabbath. Always a Sabbath. Which is why they took three days to go visit him. Because they had to take Friday off and Saturday off before they could go on Sunday. I truly believe Jesus was crucified on Thursday. Now, does it matter that much? Probably not, except we should know what we believe and why we believe it. Amen. Yeah. So just nodding her head and saying, yeah, it was Friday. It was Saturday, it was, it was Thursday in my mind. For that Sabbath was a high day, it was a holy Sabbath, it was a feast Sabbath. The, so the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Now, I explained to you that if you break their legs, then they die faster. And while we, we ran into a problem, we just crucified some guys, it was around nine o'clock, they're not dead, and we've gotta get them buried before sundown. What are we gonna do? Kill them, kill them. But there was this really, really weird prophecy, and we touched on it last night at Passover. The Passover lamb was sacrificed. The blood kept everybody from being judged by God. But he had this really strange command. Don't break any of the bones of the Passover lamb. If you were eating Passover and you went, oh, I just broke one of the you know, little bones, you were in trouble. You are not to break any bones. Why? Who cares? Eat the meat. Celebrate the feast. Because there is a prophecy. It was supposed to show you who the Messiah was. Because look at this. Then the soldiers came out, broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with them. They came out. Interesting. They walk over here and it was terrible. They take a sledgehammer basically and just break the bottom of their legs. And then they'd hang and they'd die quickly. Where was Jesus? In the middle. Why did the soldier come and break the legs of the outside man, then walk past Jesus and break the legs of the inside, other side of the man? Why did he do that? Why did he do that though? I mean, why didn't he just do it? So, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. You remember what you read, Rod? My, health, my heart has melted like wax within me. So he goes up and sticks a spear in, and when he, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be filled, fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. Year after year after year for thousand years. They ate the Passover and dad would say, don't break, don't, don't break those bones. 
Son, don't chew on that thing. Nope, take the bone and say, do not break the bone because we are commanded never to break the bone of the Passover. And they would say, why daddy? And you know what daddy would say? I have no idea whatsoever. But that's what God said. Until the lamb of God was sacrificed and the Romans were commanded to break his bones and they didn't because David also wrote a thousand years earlier that God guards all his bones. Not a single one of them is broken. Not a single one of them is broken. And then finally, two more verses. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's the prophet Zechariah, 400 years before Jesus. Now I'll be honest with you, that one is not in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So all I have is the evidence that we had before, that this was written before Jesus. But I'm believing it because of everything else. Zechariah was one of the few scriptures that isn't complete from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But Zechariah looked 400 years into the future and said, they're not gonna break his bones. They're gonna shove a spear into him. And then he looked a little further past you and me. And he said, and when he comes, they will look on him whom they pierced. Jesus is coming in a body that is pierced. Pilate had commanded them break his legs. They didn't do it. Why? Because God said they wouldn't. Instead, some anonymous soldier decides, hey, I got a better idea. Let's just stick a spear in his side and see if he's dead. Validating, confirming, and proving that there is a single man in the history of the world who can declare that he is Messiah, one and one only. Now I share all this with you in the hope that you will want truth yourself. Remember what Paul said to Agrippa when he shared the gospel with the Agrippa? He said, Agrippa, this thing was not done in a corner. Folks, God's been talking about the crucifixion of Jesus for, well, by the time it happened, over 2,000 years. 2,000 years, whether it was the fact that Isaac, the only and beloved son, would carry his own wood, and then that place would become a place where God would substitute for sacrifice. Or whether it was the fact that Jesus would be pierced, even though crucifixion hadn't even been invented for another 500 years, or that after they pierced him, that they would gamble his clothes. They wouldn't just divide it, they'd have to have a lottery for it. Or that after that, they wouldn't break any of his bones. Or that even, how about this, that before he died, they'd give him vinegar to drink. These are all provable things, all prophecies. So Paul said to Agrippa, and I say to you, the thing was not done in a corner. Do you believe the prophets? And that is the question for our generation. Do you believe the prophets? Do you believe the prophets? Do you believe that God sent his only son who was whipped because God said he would be, who was stripped because God said he would be, who was crucified because God said he would be to fully and completely pay for every sin you will ever commit? Amen. Or you could ignore the fact that this is all provable and defendable and you could just have religion or rejection. What did Pilate do? He rejected truth. What did the Jews do? They rejected truth. How did that irrationality turn out for them? Now I made my choice in 1993 when I came across something like this and I said, wait a second, if that's true and I can prove it, then there's a God. And the God who wrote that is the God. That was, that was the logic of it. If I can prove it, then there is a God. If I can disprove it, then there is no God. And today, I wanna tell you, I trust in the thousands of provable prophecies. Amen. Thousands. How many does the Islam have? Zip! How many do the Buddhists have? None! Hindus. Not a single, sing, single prophecy. You want to, comparable. Christianity, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of exact prophecies, provable, archeologically provable, all happened, or nothing. I'm gonna be a Buddhist. 
To be a Buddhist, to be a Muslim, to be a Hindu, you have to reject truth. To be a Christian, you just embrace it. I believe the truth. And I want you to know I believe the truth. And I know this, as Job said it in the oldest book of the Bible, I know that in my flesh, Travis is gonna see God. Because it was all true and Jesus has promised that I'm gonna look upon him whom they pierced and I will be with him forever and he shall call me son because he prophesied it and he always keeps his promises. So I leave that with you today. Today was my desperate attempt to tickle your intellect. If you are struggling with the answer, is this true? Go find out. That's it, just go find out. And when you have, if you've come to the conclusion that you have proven that everything I just said is not true, or anything I just said is not true, please come show it to me, I will look at it with you. Prove, keep me from this false thing I've fallen into. Because I know this, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Lord, thank you for the word. Thank you that John wrote it down. Thank you that Jesus absolutely fulfilled it. Lord, I am actually a little bit stunned today that Jesus knew there was one prophecy that hadn't been fulfilled, so he had to say, I thirst, just to make sure the vinegar was offered to him. Wow. I want to bless the name of your son who didn't say a single word as he was whipped. Not a single word. I want to thank you, God, that there were four guards and five pieces of clothing to prove that the Messiah was Jesus. I want to bless your name, God, that you told Moses, don't break the Passover lamb's bones, not a single one, so that we would know that Jesus was the lamb of God, the Passover lamb of God. I want to bless you. I bless your name. For you have proven to me, and Lord, when my doubts rise up, when the enemy comes to me and speaks doubts to my heart, Lord, any of our hearts, remind us of these things that we can point to, we can prove, we can base our lives upon. We have truth. Jesus is the Son of God, died for our sins, and is coming back. Amen. Bless his name forever. Amen. Amen. God bless everybody.